G'day and welcome to my channel. Last weekend we had the Australian National Home Brew Conference or ANHC and I got to meet Scott Janish. In my opinion, Scott should be knighted. Sir Scott. Most people will know Scott as the author of the new IPA. But what if I told you this book was wrong? I got it wrong. I got it wrong. Wrong. I got it wrong. Now this book's been out for about two years now. I bought it when it first came out. I got my edition signed by Scott. That's how much I love it. Mine's been read a few times. Go and buy it if you haven't read it. Now I collect brewing books and over the years, many have contradicted each other. You buy one and it becomes the, you know, the now book and everyone reads it and this is the way. And then, you know, six months later, 12 months later, it's either forgotten or, you know, they've moved on and found new studies have come out and they've come out with new facts. For me, one of the highlights of the conference was Scott being there and he's, he had two talks about hazy beers on day one and day two. And there was another person there talking about hazy beers as well, which we can't leave out of this conversation. And that was Derek from Bluestone Yeasts. Derek spoke on the first day about some experiments they did with hazy beers using his NIPA yeast. And by sheer accident or coincidence, Scott Janish's speech he had ready was on the same subject they'd both done nearly exactly the same experiments or had done for them by yeast companies and both the results were the same. Contradicting some of the information that we believed, I believed, Scott believed, everyone believed to be true about the haze in beers. So it's slide night. Let's go and have a look at some slides and I'll show you quickly. Now I'm not gonna show you, go into the full details about this. I'm gonna skim over it briefly uh, and Eventually, the ANHC and Grain and Grape are going to release the whole talks from the ANHC uh, and the slides with the talk with the audio. That's the plan anyway, so hopefully they'll be out soon. And I want to thank them for lending me the slides uh, to use in this video and thank them for the whole weekend, really. The sponsors are Grain and Grape, Kegland, um, Bintani, and I've probably forgotten a few. But thanks very much to the organisers. ANHC happens every two years. It's only just happened, of course. So unfortunately, you've got to wait two years for the next one. But I'll be talking it up next time, for sure. I think I've been to three. I've been to at least two, maybe three. <laughs> so let's have a slide night. I'll put my glasses on so I look more intelligent. Here's ready for slide night. As I said before, I'm not going to go through everything in detail. I'll leave that for the ANHC videos when they come out, but we'll give you a quick look. And what I was amazed about was this dry hopping regime. But we'll briefly discuss a few things that people that haven't read the book might not have seen before. You will notice that some of my fonts have gone a little funky on the computer. And this is where Scott gets a lot of his information from. As I said, we're going to skip over a few things. I know thiols are a big topic right now, so we can have a stop and have a quick look at this. And if you want to pause it and have a look, it just gives you an idea of the flavour and aroma and which hops are rich and high in those thiols. One interesting topic was mash hopping. I haven't done much of that myself because some people say yes, some people say no. And for me, it didn't make sense that, you know, you put the hop oils in the mash, then they go through the boil and all the whole other process and how that's going to benefit the beer at the end any more than putting it in the boil. But what was talked about, that the hops you put in the mash, the actual aroma from them hops may not benefit the beer directly, but that sets up uh, precursors for better hop aroma from hops you put in later in the process. And again on thiols, there was a lot discussed about these bioengineered uh, yeast strains they're using uh, in the US, but unfortunately they're not allowed in Australia at the moment, so we can't use those at all. So here's some dry hopping tips. Now this was discussed on Cellar Dwellers and some of my live forums um, many years ago, because there was a study that came out, oh, I could be wrong here, but I, th I think it may have been a Canada, someone done a thesis on the dry hopping, and that's when I started talking about the two to four day dry hop, uh, and it could be done uh, in as little as a couple of hours even, They do. if you could recirculate the wort you know, in the fermenter without causing any oxidation, which is really, really hard to do at home, uh, I haven't even attempted to do it. Uh, Sapwood Cellars is Scott's Brewery, and they tend to dry hop for about two days uh, at about four degrees. And you can see there that they rouse the dry hops, which would be by bubbling CO2 up through them to put them in suspension. 
But I think there's something important to remember here. If I was to dry hop at four degrees at home in one of my old fermenters, the dry hops would just sink to the bottom at that temperature and not do much at all. Uh, to rouse them, the yeast would still be there. Then you'd be rousing the yeast and the hops. The yeast is going to strip some of the goodness from the hops and you're just going to end up with a murky beer. Some of that yeast might struggle to flock out again. So you're going to end up with a murky beer and some, a lot of the flavors being taken by the yeast anyway. So if you're going to use this method, it's really important to get rid of the yeast first, like they do in a brewery. Using conicals, for instance, they pull the yeast out the bottom, then they dry hop, and then they can rouse those yeasts with carbon dioxide. So unless you can do that at home, this might not be the best method for you. In my humble opinion, if you've got a single regular style fermenter at home and you get, you need to dry hop, you're probably better off going in a point or a point, when I say a point, it's, it's like Plato, so probably three or four gravity points from the end. Dry hop then, raise your temperature. That will help you combat hop creep, the warm temps with the yeast activity in there and the hops. It will also rouse the hops by the, the little bit of movement in the yeast left, and it will also help you scrub any oxygen that gets in. You know, it'll get pushed out by the yeast activity and, and by the CO2 released that's in suspension when you add the hops, uh, it re release CO2, and that all helps to push any little bit of oxygen that got in. That was part of his first talks, but that's not what we're here for. Though next up was Dr. Derek Lacey, founder and CEO of Bluestone Yeast. If you haven't used Bluestone Yeast, I can't rate them highly enough. Hopefully I'll be able to do some work with them in the future and show you a few uh, different yeast strains. I've used the Pilsen and the NIPA yeast by them so far. What Derek's talk was about was about hazing beer, again, about the yeast mainly because he is yeast and what the interaction that it has with hops and other ingredients, proteins and things in the wort. I'm going to skip over a lot of these slides and get to the main point of this video. I guess it's important here to talk about how it's measured and the readings. So water is 0 0.05 to 1.5 and, you know, a porter might be 20 to 200. Uh, orange juice is 300 to 900, which you can see is very close to hazy, and milk is over 4,000. The reason we're here and why we were wrong is all about dry hop timing and hazy beers. Of course, there can be differences in yeast, but the fact that these two studies were done separately and they come up with the same conclusion is pretty good evidence. So there's the materials and methods they're using for this test. It was a fresh wort kit from Grain and Grape, a Kolsch, and they used a few different hops. And that's their pitch rate, and they fermented at 20C with a dry hop amount of 8 grams a litre. We're just going to skip through these. You can see these when the videos are released. But this was interesting. Galaxy's very good at haze. Eclipse was okay. Citra was okay too. But you can see their Galaxy's far above. This is, But this is what we're here for to determine which day to dry hop for maximum haze. As everybody knows, we were told a dry hop very early from day one to day two to day three, high Krausen to get the most haze. That's when the biotransformation happened and that's where the haze happened. Well, that's not what these studies showed at all. So this is the results of the bluestone tests and day seven, believe it or not, was the best day to dry hop for haze. Day one was the worst for haze. That's kind of amazing because everyone thought it happened early and you would think at day seven, you know, that ferment's got to be nearly done. Most of my ferments are over in that time. You know, they've just finished maybe day six and they've slowed right down. Maybe they've got another point to go at day seven. But uh, that's, that was amazing to me. And just to sum those tests up, the British strange tend to promote the haze. That's why London Ale 3 was the classic yeast, I think. And three hops to promote haze. Uh, Galaxy was the best out of the three they tested, with day seven as the highest level of haze. That blew my mind. And if you want to pause it, there's a couple of the caveats there. You know, it wasn't a hazy bee wort. They didn't double dry hop. And of course, other hop varieties could have been tested. So now we'll go to Scott's second talk the next day about haziness in beer. As I said, we're not going to dive too deep, but we're here for the dry hop timing in haze. And Amiga Yeast did the same tests over in the US. They used the popular 
haze positive yeasts. But as you can see there on the test, the haziest was yet again day seven. It was clearer on day one. And I thought this was amazing here. Just a quarter of the dry hop was added right at the start and the remainder on day seven. But when that quarter was added at the start, it can re reduce the haze. And this is what I was talking about the, before, the way I have always done it, by dry hopping at active fermentation. Well, until I got my conicals. Now I've got my conicals. I can, you know, get rid of the yeast, add hops later. I can rouse them if I like, and I don't have to worry so much. But if I was in the one fermenter with my yeast and everything in there, bang, dry hop at active fermentation. And knowing all this information now, this is where it can be reversed. So if you dried to hop day one, it, lagers might benefit from it. Instead of trying to day hop, dry hop later and getting haze from it, it might just be better off <laughs> for your lager to dry up on day one. And see, that's, that's nearly the total opposite of what we've been being told lately. There's a little bit more information if you want to read through it. I'm not going to go through it all, but that tells you what they did. 15 strains were tested, but the OG was 1061. They also listed hops varieties for haze. It doesn't seem the galaxy's in that equation here. But you can see Sabro and Citra, Simcoe, some of my favourite hops are really good for it. Even Cascade. Just going to skip through some of these things. I thought this might be interesting for people that didn't realise, but there was a study done with malted versus unmalted grains. And you often hear everywhere in the brewing world that, you know, if you want some haze, unmalted grain. Use some flaked oats and, and you know, flaked wheat, flaked barley. But their study proved that raw or unmalted ingredients made a less hazy beer. So the study looking at the haze of beer brewed from a control of 100% malted barley compared two beers with either 20% and 40% of barley replaced with unmalted wheat found that the higher addition of unmalted wheat, the less haze was permanent, the less permanent haze. So that's about all I'm going to go over. You'll have to wait for the ANHC videos to come out. But that was amazing to me. Those two things alone was the dry hopping times. If you want to dry hop a beer and have a clear beer, day one is not a bad option. If you want to get the haziest beer you can from your dry hops, day seven. That, that blew all our minds because we all thought the opposite, you know, and also the fact that the unmalted grains and things aren't as important as we thought they were. So again, I thank the ANHC and Peter for sending me the slides. We'll talk to Peter in another video. But if you're interested, I'll leave a link down below for Peter's book too. He does a lot on older style of beers. You've heard me talk about them before in live streams. A lot of Australian uh, older type beers. And he's got a new book out, which I haven't read yet. So I found that extremely interesting. And the, I'm no way poo-pooing on this book, you know what I mean? Go and buy it and read it. It's very interesting. And so lots of great science and facts in there. And if you've been following me on YouTube, you know that I've promoted Scott Janish's before this week, way before this book, his blog. Uh, one I remembered and told him about was about his study on oats. I thought it was really good too. Uh, a few things just before we go. If you get to Grain and Grape this weekend, hopefully this video gets out in time. There, might, there was a whole full keg of it kegged yesterday, but they brewed up one of Scott's beers. Uh, we had one keg at the conference, and now there's one on tap now in the shop. It was yesterday, it was kegged. I happened to be tapped when I was there, so I had another glass, just a small one. There's plenty left. So if you get in this weekend, during the week, or maybe next weekend, there might be some left. On that subject, uh, we'll talk about Bluestone yeasts again. They are now available, well, at Grain and Grape, they've been for a while. They're now available at Kegland as well. I'll leave links below. Also, when I was in Grain and Grape yesterday, I picked up some Incognito hops, some Citra. I think they had some Mosaic and some Citra there. Uh, the Mosaic looked a bit low, but uh, there was a, still a few of these left at least yesterday. So again, a big thank you to the ANHC, all the committee, the volunteers, the sponsors, Kegland, Grain and Grape, Bintani, and all the others that were there. Go and buy the book. Do it for Scott. Say good day. Tell him I sent you. <laughs> and I'll let you know when the uh, Grain and Grape videos or the ANHC videos are out. And uh, I'll give, it a, give him a shout out again. And you can go and watch the conferences we sat and watched on the weekend. It was very interesting. There was Stu from Voyager Malt. Uh, there, there was a lots of other speakers. There was the Rockstar Brewer was there. Gave a speech on water. All sorts of things. Uh, I think you'll enjoy it when they come out. So please like, subscribe, share. And I'll see you in the next one. Thanks to my patrons. 
for without them these videos couldn't happen have a good weekend cheers